Okay, well, hello everyone. I am, um, my name is Dr. Greg Morrison. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Houston in the Department of Physics. And today I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about um, a summer research opportunity for undergraduates uh, in, in collaboration with the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics. Um, so I've thrown a little bit of information up here just so that you can you know, take a screenshot or, or whatever, but you can find the, the full details of the, uh, the program uh, on, uh, on at this website, uh, as well as a quick summary of sort of the, the, the overall details. Um, this, this program is directed by Dr. Chung, um, at, uh, at, uh, who has a joint appointment at Rice and the, and, and the University of Houston. Uh, I'm gonna be managing most of the day-to-day -day things. And so what that means is that if you have any questions, you should send emails to me. Um, there are a couple of other faculty. Uh, Dr. May uh, is at the University of Houston and is joining the, the project this year. Uh, and Dr. Whitford is at um, Northeastern University and is handling the, uh, the Boston related stuff. Okay, so today what we're, oops, let's see if I can get these to advance. Um, today, what I wanna do is, first of all, just I, I said the word uh, Center for Theoretical Biological Physics, so I need to tell you what biological physics is and I need to tell you a little bit about the center, okay? Um, so there's gonna be a brief summary. Um, I have, uh, so Dr. Andre Gasek is here, and after my brief summary, he's going to talk into, in some detail about the kinds of, of projects that you might be working on uh, as, as, a member of the, um, as, uh, as a member of the FIS program. Uh, after he speaks, I will more completely describe the FIS program, and then we'll, I'll, I'll hang out and we, we can just, uh, I'll answer any questions that you, that you have. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. So the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics is a collaboration uh, between a large number of universities uh, nationwide. Uh, it's centered in Houston. Um, so the University of Houston, Rice, and Baylor College of Medicine are um, sort of the core of uh, the Center for Theor Theoretical Biological Physics. Um, but we have collaborators in Boston. So there's a, a new branch, or a, new, um, uh, a new site at, in, uh, at Northeastern University in Boston. Um, that, that really brings a sort of national scope to the, uh, to the center. Um, the CTBP is composed of 16 faculty, three of whom are National Academy of Science members. These are, that's a somewhat, something of a big deal. Um, and um, that, what, it, what it means is that this is a strong center for really active science, to have these great minds uh, all in sort of the same group, um, producing and collaborating with each other, uh, producing new science. Um, why are they in Houston? Well, there's, Houston's actually a really fantastic place to be working in the field of biology uh, or biophysics because of the, um, uh, the location of the, uh, uh, the, because of the existence of the Texas Medical Center. Um, the Texas Medical Center is in between Rice and the University of Houston um, and, uh, and houses, I believe it's 20,000 um, scientific researchers, either MDs or PhDs, uh, that are actively working on uh, better understanding uh, biology and medicine um, in, in cutting in, in cutting edge research, right? So we're, Houston really is at the heart of a very big and very active, uh, science, biologically uh, active um, research, um, uh, research core. Okay. Um, so what's biophysics? So many of y'all are, are familiar with biology, probably, uh, and many of y'all are familiar with physics, probably. Uh, if you're familiar with physics, you may be most familiar with inclined planes and, and these sorts of things, unless you're a physics major. And you may not know that there is actually something useful that physicists can say about biology. So I want to talk just really briefly about the kinds of projects. None of these are necessarily what you would be working on in, uh, in the, uh, if you were to be a member of the FIS program, but I just want to give you a sense. Right, so this first video is showing you DNA. We're all sort of familiar with DNA and the double helix shape that, that it has. And we're also probably somewhat familiar with the fact that it has this genetic information and uh, which is very important for uh, both being alive and, uh, and, and the, the, the various characteristics that you have as a, as a person. Um, each of your cells actually has about six feet of DNA uh, in it. So six feet of DNA in every single cell means that the DNA has to be squished down very tightly, very compactly. Um, this compactification has multiple scales. So what, I've, what you're seeing in this video is um, the, the uh, so right now it's showing the second layer. Uh, the first layer is essentially histone binding, uh, which causes this DNA to wrap around itself. Uh, then you end up with this 
uh, this hierarchy of bundling that occurs, such that as you zoom out and out and out, the DNA is very tightly confined. So a lot is known about this, right? Some of the molecular mechanisms are really well known, but there's kind of a big question of, well, the, the in between, we don't know so well, right? We don't actually know whether or not the DNA adopts a single shape or whether or not it sort of, uh, sort of flows inside of the, the, the shape, the, uh, inside of the chromosome, right? What, what the actual dynamics of the DNA is inside of the chromosome is something that is not understood. And that's something physical, right? The DNA is sliding, there are interactions between these things. The DNA is crowded, it's crammed inside of the cell. And so there's a lot of questions that one can ask about the physics of this process. We're also probably familiar with the idea of neurons in the brain. Um, so neurons essentially are connected to each other in some way. Uh, the, the, these dendritic connections essentially are, uh, permit information to be shared uh, between, uh, between neurons. And um, these connections are dynamic, right? They can form um, whenever, you, whenever you form a new memory, um, these, uh, the, these neural connections change in some way. And there are a huge number of open questions related to how that change occurs and, um, and the, the physical processes by which that memory can be expressed, right? Neural firing is not, the, not exactly the same thing as you thinking a thought. Right, so there's, there's, there's a large number of open questions related to the physics of how neurons interact with each other um, and how they, how they process information. And so one, one, this, is a, this is another example, this is a cell dividing. So what you can kind of see, this, this is, uh, what you can kind of see is something that looks like hands that are sort of ripping the, the cell apart, right? This is, uh, this is meiosis. Those things, those hands that are pulling things apart are, um, are formed of microtubules that exist in the cytoskeleton. And this is, a, this is a fully dynamic process that is, uh, so this is a dynamic process um, that is, that, that, um, that's, that's internal, right? This is, this is not something that is being, they're not being pulled apart by the outside, they're being pulled apart by the inside. And so there's a whole, lar there's a large number of questions, open questions related to this topic. How do they, how do they accomplish this task using just the, 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 um, uh, the, 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 the molecules that are inside of the cytoskeleton? How do they know that it's time to divide? Um, how, uh, how the process works um, is, is, how the process of cell division works is, a, is largely an open question in many ways. Um, and physics, physics can help. When I say that it's being pulled apart from the inside, that means forces are involved, right? There's fluid moving around. And so, so there are a lot of open questions uh, related to bio, biology that physicists can help with. And that is, that is what the Center for Theoretical Biological Physics is really all about. So there are sort of four categories of, of uh, research that, that the CTDP is interested in, uh, ranging from the uh, genome structure, which I sort of hinted at earlier, um, how networks, uh, how, in, how information can move within networks, um, how uh, machine learning related to um, experimental data on the, the chromosomes, um, and trying to understand uh, memory um, and cytoskeletal behavior. Okay, so that's just a very brief, broad picture of what biophysics is and what CTDP is. Uh, now I'm going to ask Dr. Andre Gasek to, um, he's going to give a talk uh, to describe some of his research. Let me see if I can stop sharing um, in, in a little bit more detail. And then I will return. How do I stop sharing? There we go. Um, uh, and then I'll return to talk in more detail about what the FIS program actually is. Go. All right. Um, can everyone see this? Yep. All right. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me to give you this uh, very brief uh, overview of things. Um, I first, though, want to uh, step back. I, I mean, Dr. Morrison did a great job on explaining the what is biophysics. Um, I also have just one or two slides on, on that, uh, but just to step back on what I think is important um, in the frontiers of, of physics itself, usually you characterize physics, uh, uh, the, new, the new physics that people are trying to discover are, are either on the small length and time scales like particles and, and, and you know, string theory and things like that, or on the large scale like the cosmology and, and uh, what we see in astrophysics. 
Uh, and these are all very exciting. But to me, the, the most exciting part of, of, of physics is uh, uh, this branch, which is kind of in the middle of length and time, but you add complexity. And these, these sort of things that are non-equilibrium, heterogeneous, many length scales, you know, uh, non-linearity and, and emergent phenomena and life or biology contains many of these things, actually all of these. Um, and so really, I, I think studying biology uh, as a physicist is, uh, is really to understand, you know, the physics of complexity, in, in my opinion. Um, and my, my favorite aspect of biophysics is, is actually this, the, the, the aspect of emergence that, that, you know, when you have many, a collection of many things, they, they emerge into uh, a new thing. So here I am showing just uh, fluorescence of, of uh, signals of, of neurons talking to each other. Um, and one neuron spikes or signals, uh, doesn't really do anything, but when you have a collection of them together, you have what, you know, uh, a thought or possibly a memory. Uh, similarly, uh, a bird, the velocity of one bird uh, is, uh, you know, you don't, you don't get these beautiful migratory patterns just from one bird, but uh, the collection of them interacting with each other gives you uh, a, this coherent uh, migration of a, a path of a flock of birds. Um, and, and, and just on the micro, even on the small, small scales with like proteins, you know, uh, one amino acid uh, doesn't dictate the whole function of a protein. When you have a collection of all the amino acids together, they emerge into this uh, molecule that functions uh, and, and is, a, is, is one of the basic um, uh, machines in, in every single cell. Um, so, but the system that I'm very uh, interested in as in my, in my postdoc at CDBP is actually a, a, a neuron and understanding how a neuron forms its memory at the, at the single neuron scale. And uh, this system, I, like I've mentioned before, this system contains many different aspects of being out of equilibrium. It's a, it's a, it's a thing that uh, requires energy input. It's a heterogeneous it requires, and it's also requires many length scales. You know, you have to understand the, the uh, single proteins involved and how they interact with one, one another. And also, um, but, uh, and, and then also how on, on the different scales. So if you come back to this macroscopic picture, how does that affect this picture? And so uh, there, there are many uh, uh, length scales that you have to act, you have to actually take into consideration. And and how does how does all this emerge? Um, well, naturally. And how does this? Um, basically, there there are, there are many physical questions that come about from uh, from any uh, emergent uh, phenomenon. Um, so this is a, a picture for those of you who are not familiar with the neuron is you have this basically the cell body um, that has this this axon um, and and the, uh, the the cell body has these dendrites that are coming out as well and these dendrites are attached to all to uh, to many other neurons as well and it's the connections between these dendrites uh, that that form what is called a, a synapse and what, what I'm interested in is basically this very small region here is how is it that this synapse is formed? Uh, basically, how does it form and then also uh, grow? And there's this uh, term called plasticity, which maybe you're familiar with, but a memory basically forms uh, by the growth of these connections and then also the, the shape change of these connections. Um, and so basically my, my ultimate goal is to understand how is it that these dendritic spines grow in response to some sort of stimulation. So uh, here's basically just a, a model picture of what a, uh, of that uh, blown up uh, version, basically the blown up picture of a dendritic spine that once it receives some sort of stimulation, uh, you have this uh, uh, basically a, a signal to increase increase the the density of, of certain amount of certain proteins and these proteins create a structure that actually push and change the shape of, of this dendritic spine 
And, and this shape change uh, comes also permanently. So you have, you, you, you have maybe this fluid uh, of, of proteins in a solution that, that create also this, uh, act, this, this distinct structure as well. And so then basically what, what you have here is that this uh, structure itself uh, might be key to, to how memory is formed. Um, and then also this, this uh, aspect of uh, fluidization and then becoming um, uh, a coherent, uh, a, basically a solid structure. Um, and so with this, uh, but, but to, to, so to understand how, to understand this theoretically, we need to ask what, are the, what is the physics involved in this? And the, the physics involved really is, is two aspects. One is this uh, new, new physics that, that is uh, not, just, not just for biological systems, but it's called active matter. I showed you already one picture before with those, uh, a flock of birds. You can think of a flock of birds as, as you know, uh, an active particle um, and, and you know, basically a swarm of active particles. But also you can, you can create uh, self-propelled particles by, uh, you know, and basically you can create self-propelled particles by having, you know, a, a system that where a particle dissolves uh, one way, but it doesn't dissolve the other way. And so you have this uh, dissolving that actually pushes the particle forward. So you can have this active matter in um, in synth synthetic synthetic things as well um, so this is actually a brand new uh, field that's come about in the past well at least it's, it's become very popular in the past five to ten years uh, and then also combining this with glass glass physics so glasses are also another field that are uh, I mean it's been well studied but at the same time there are a lot of questions just with glasses that we don't quite understand uh, but a glass is is a system that uh, that evades crystallization. So whenever you have a water that freezes, it, it, you, you, if you super cool the water, you can actually create a glass where the structure of, of the water molecules stay in place and it doesn't create a crystal form, but you still have the solid properties of that glass. Um, and then what's interesting about glasses is that they retain the structure of, well, they, they basically have this amorphous structure, but they still retain a quote unquote memory. Um, so this is why we think that glass, the glass physics is very important uh, in understanding how memory is formed in, inside of the neuron. Um, so I, I, I started working on this using this thing called, uh, with, it's a phase field model. And uh, I've just tried to understand how an active droplet would change in terms of uh, certain conditions. And here I'm just showing you an example of this phase field where, uh, where you have this droplet in the center that, that uh, whenever it, it, it contracts, this droplet can contract over time and can also produce different shapes uh, and grow uh, depending on, on the different tuning, uh, the tuning of parameters. Um, but uh, the, the thing is that this is, this is just an active droplet. The, the thing that I want to produce uh, model next is actually give you, is, is to model the active glass form of this. And this is a, a ongoing research on this, but, uh, but basically we think that this active uh, glass will, will be able to, to retain its shapes, uh, retain its shape and have a memory of its shape uh, yeah, uh, and so basically what I just mentioned that in the, my future directions are to, well, also produce something that looks more like a, a more, more like a, a dendritic spine and then have this, uh, have this active matter uh, modeled to include glassy dynamics into the system. Um, and so with that, we can uh, hopefully have a, laid the foundation of understanding how learning and memory works inside the neuron. Um, so with that, is there any questions? If not, uh, Dr. Morrison. Yep. Okay, well, thank you very much, Andre. Um, so 
Andre will be a mentor uh, for uh, for the FIS program. Oops, looks like I started from the beginning. Sorry about that. Oh, I guess I'm not sharing yet, so that's okay. Um, let me see if I can make this computer work today. There we go. All right, so let me share PowerPoint. Share. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, let's see. So, so Andre is going to be one of the uh, potential mentors uh, that you might work with, and if you were to uh, be accepted to the FIS program, and the project that he was describing is one of the possible projects that you could be working on, at least, uh, at least a, uh, an effort related to that topic. Right, so you're not necessarily going to be doing precisely what what he talked about, um, but you, if you uh, if you found that uh, summary of how we can use physics to better understand uh, uh, spine formation, uh, if you found that exciting, that's great. Um, if you found that you have no idea about what exactly is going on, that's okay too. Right, we almost everyone that, that that heard that talk did not understand a part of it, and that's that's. I mean, <laughs> Andre's the only one who understood all of it, and that's okay because this is a multidisciplinary field, and we don't expect you to know everything from the start. Okay, okay, so let me tell you a little bit about what the program is, um, and uh, give you some details about how uh, what it is that you'd be committing to if you were to to join us. So what? So we at the at the Center for Theoret Theoretical Biological Physics, which I'm going to call CTBE from now on, just because it's faster, um, recruit undergraduates from uh, from schools across Houston um, to try to participate in a 10 week summer internship program. Um, you will be paid for your time, um, and what that means is that we want to, the reason that we're paying you for your time is so that you treat this as a job, right? What we want is for you to work uh, because. Um, a commitment to hard work is one of the keys to actually succeeding in any, any research or scientific field. Uh, and so we want to motivate you to, to work on these projects. Okay. You will be paired with a single person that will be sort of the director of your research program. That person, uh, and Andre is one of them, uh, potentially, um, will, be, will design a pro project for you that is related to something that they're working on that they believe that they can help guide you to completing a task. Okay. Um, you will collaborate with them. So the, the goal is not to throw you on your own, like hand you a project and then check in 10 weeks later. You're going to be collab. This is a collaborative process. And so, um, uh, and so you, you're, you should expect that you can rely on your mentor to help you. But again, the work is for you. Um, the mentors come from Rice University of Houston and also from, uh, from Northeastern University in Boston. Um, they're all uh, postdocs or senior graduate students, and so they have a good sense of how to do research, but they're also not um, faculty members that have no time for you, right? They, they, they will be available for you to, uh, uh, during the work. Um, the goal of the 10-week pro project is for you to produce a poster, and I'll show you an example of what these posters look like, but you're going to put together a scientific poster that describes the research um, uh, that you did, uh, which includes an introduction, conclusion, and all of the sorts of all, all of the effort that you put in over that that ten week period. So that is the final target. Uh, let's see if I can make this go. Okay. Um, so what what is it that CTBP wants out of this, right? So uh, what we want is to increase talent, the pool of talented students moving into the field of biophysics, right? And so what what in order to accomplish that. One of the goals that CTBP has is to train undergraduates to move on to graduate school in biophysics and succeed in biophysics. Uh, and the, the best way to do that, we believe, um, is to show you what graduate school is going to look like, give you the experience of, of what active scientific research in biophysics looks like, and give you a background at how to succeed in graduate school. And so the, this, this FIS program is going to involve both of those things on a regular basis. Um, FIS fellows, are you're working in cutting edge science. Nobody knows the, the answer, right? We all have a direction that we're going. But in research, if you, know where you're, if you know the answer in research from the beginning, you're not doing research. You're just doing math for fun. Um, you, need to, you, need to not, you need to be working in an area where there's uncertainty. Um, and so, and, and because of that, uh, it's a very exciting thing to be doing, 
Um, and it's also uh, possible for your effort to be in, in, included in a paper. Uh, so a research article that is published, if that is the case, you will be listed as an author. And we have, we've had multiple students succeed, uh, multiple projects um, from students go on to be published. I think it's 10 total papers uh, that, that over the past uh, five years that have, that have been produced that involved FIS students. And we're hopeful that we can continue that trend. Um, the, the other, there's another aspect to this program that I want to mention. The FIS mentors are senior graduate students or postdocs. Many of them are hoping to go on to be a professor uh, and teach students of their own. And what they're learn, the, the mentors are learning how to do that with you, right? So the, uh, excuse me, sorry about that. Um, the mentors are learning how to do that with you. And so it's a, it's a learning experience that everyone benefits from. Uh, I want to introduce, so these are, uh, the, the pictures here are students that participated over the summer last year. Um, of course, COVID uh, means that we were fully online, but these are, these are the participants. I also uh, want to give you a sense of what a scientific poster looks like. This is the sort of output that, that we're looking for. Uh, on the left um, is, uh, is, is a project uh, that, that Kyle uh, worked on, and on the right, Michael. Um, Michael is, is a sophomore biology major that had no programming experience. This is his poster and he won the best poster competition that year. Um, and so it really, it, he's, he's learned a lot about um, how to do research um, and he's continued to work with his mentor and we're hopeful that, we're, that he'll be publishing a paper next, uh, 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 at the end of the semester. Same with Kyle. So Kyle had more experience with programming, but we, we do believe that it's likely that his project that he started working on over the summer, he's continued working on it. Uh, and we're hopeful that, the, that uh, he and Sumit Todd will be able to submit a paper soon. Um, let's see, I'm sorry, I need to read my heading. Um, so there's an app, so the, the question now is, uh, so a natural question, how do, how do you get to be part of this program? Well, so you apply, um, and the application deadline, uh, which, which I'll mention sort of at the end, but the application deadline is next Friday. Um, our goal is to find um, scientifically curious and highly motivated students. Okay, our goal is not to find an undergraduate that already knows everything about biophysics. So do not panic if you don't know everything about biophysics, right? I bet in this room there are plenty of biology majors, and that's great, and you probably aren't really strong in physics. And I bet that there are plenty, I hope that there are some physics majors, and I bet that you're not all that strong in biology. Um, and so, so it's completely okay to, to not know everything. What will happen, you'll submit an application, which I'll describe later, uh, all of the mentors are going to read those applications and we'll, we'll put together a short list of, of people and then interview them. Okay. You'll be interviewed um, and we'll ask you a few questions about uh, your scientific interest, uh, your, uh, your, your uh, scholastic background, um, and try to get a sense of who you are as a person. Because when you read it on a page, it can be a little hard to tell. The, the, it's, it's hard to gauge excitement. Right? And so we want to ask you questions about science, what you care about, um, and, and, and get a sense of who you are. Okay. From, that, from those interviews, we'll choose, um, there, there are on the order of 10 spots this, uh, this summer, uh, we'll choose 10 students um, and we will, um, uh, we will be, and you'll be, uh, you, you will become a, a member of the FIS uh, program and, 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 uh, and, and be assigned a mentor. Uh, one thing that I want to mention is that this opportunity is in collaboration with CTBEP, um, and we have multiple recruitment sites in Houston. Uh, we've actually expanded this summer. Uh, this is the first summer that we're attempting an expansion. So in previous years, we only had University of Houston and Houston Community College. Now we're expanding to include UHD, uh, UHCL, uh, TSU, and uh, uh, San Houston State. Uh, so I want to mention that because this is a competitive process, right? We are looking, we, 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 we are not expecting you to know everything. We are looking for students that we think can succeed in this 10 week program, right? Because it isn't, it is not easy. Uh, it's, it's rewarding and exciting, but it's not easy. Um, and so because of that, um, th th this is a competitive, competitive process and the, the pool of applicants are drawn from across Houston. So I do want to, I, I do want to be clear about that. Okay. Okay. So if if you if you if you apply and we choose to uh, to to um, uh, accept you into the program, you're making a commitment to a few things, right? One of them, and one of the most important things, is that you're going to be committed to learning something new. I just told you it's fine for you to not know everything, but you need to know something new at the end. Otherwise, we haven't done our job. 
uh, it's an interdisciplinary field and you're always going to be coming, uh, you're always going to be behind, right? And so uh, your mentor is going to help you, you, you know, again, you're not going to be thrown to the wolves, but you have to do the work. Um, you have to commit to meeting with your mentor regularly, right? It's very important that we be able to make sure that you're not, um, that, that, that you're making progress, right? You only have 10 weeks to accomplish a, a research goal. That's not easy. Um, and so it's important that we can check in, talk to you, make sure you're doing okay, and make sure that you're, uh, you're making progress. Um, this is academia, so there is a lot of flexibility in what, how you define your time, right? But we're, you, with collaboration with your mentor, you're gonna set a schedule and you have to keep that schedule, okay? So there's going to be, you know, we do want to be flexible uh, if you have constraints, but it's also important to recognize this is a job, this is work, uh, and so, so, uh, so keeping a schedule is gonna be an important thing and you need to commit to that. Um, every week there's gonna be a lunch seminar this lunch, seminar, this lunch seminar is going to essentially talk to you about how to succeed in grad school, how to apply for grad school, uh, what, how to write a poster, uh, a scientific poster. Uh, it's going to give you a sense of how to be successful in graduate school. Uh, and uh, even the mentors learn something from, from these meetings. And so it's, it, it's a really exciting, uh, it's a really helpful um, uh, event. And so it's important that that is, an, that is another commitment that you're making. Um, and then finally, I've already mentioned, you're going to produce a poster and you're going to present it. Okay. Uh, and you're going to present it at a public session. So the, 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 uh, the, the big shots from the National Academy of Sciences, they're going to look at your poster and ask you questions. And they'll be nice, but it's, you know, it, it's important to, to, to do a good job, right? So um, let's see. Um, obviously, we can't have any discussion anymore about anything unless I mention the pandemic, uh, because it's been so disruptive. Um, so the first thing to say is that we will absolutely be having the, uh, the FIS program will exist even, no matter what the status of the, the pandemic is. If we have to be fully online, that's completely fine. Uh, we, were last, we were last summer um, and, uh, and, and perhaps that will be required this summer. Um, depending on the status though, you know, vac the vaccination is, is happening. We don't really know what that's going to look like in the end. So uh, I, I want to be really clear is uh, that no FIS participant will be required to be physically present anywhere. Okay. Um, it, it, it may be possible for you to come to campus. We have not determined whether or not Rice will allow that. Uh, but if you don't want to come to campus, that's okay. Um, you, you still have to work, you still have to log in and, and meet with, a, meet with you, you have to participate in the program, but it is okay for you to do that remotely. Likewise, your mentors do not have to be physically present, even if you are, right? I'm not forcing them to do that either. So it could be that you're in person, if that's what you choose to do, and Rice permits that to, to, uh, to be the case, but your mentor may still be remote. Okay. Um, and one other thing, we had originally hoped that we would be able to fly some students to Boston to live in Boston. The pandemic simply does not allow that to happen this year. And so I just want to be clear about that. Um, so um, the Northeastern interactions will only be remote. Okay. Um, anyone can apply if you're, if you're in any STEM adjacent field, as long as you know how to, as long as you um, know a bit of science um, and love science and want to learn something new, um, that it's, it, your, your degree plan doesn't matter. Um, most of these projects are going to be computational in nature, but that means is computer programming. Um, and that is to your benefit if you have some experience with that. It is, however, not required that you have programming experience. If you don't have any experience, don't think that you should not apply. Almost every summer, we, we take a few students that have very limited experience, and we just make sure that we give them extra training related to programming. Okay. Um, so the, the key thing, if you are a curious person and excited about science and you're willing to work hard, you should apply for this program. And if you think science is dull or you don't want to work, I would not suggest applying. <laughs> Okay, so in order to apply, there's a particular email where we're going to collect these things. So you do not, you don't send your application to me. You send it to this um, uh, this FISCTBP at central.uh.edu, uh, including a resume, um, a, a one or two page statement about your research interests and aspirations, like you know, what what it is what is it that you want to do with your life, and, and why is it that you're excited about science, uh, and also a list of all science courses that you have passed thus far in your degree plan. One thing, I want to, one thing I want to point out is that we're not considering GPA um, or grades in this application. It is okay if, if you don't need to include um, the, the grade necessarily. 
Okay. Um, the purpose of the interview is for us to be able to get a sense of who you are um, in a way that numbers wouldn't necessarily let us. Okay. So the grades are not going to be a threshold that you need to worry about. Um, and so, uh, so that's the application process. And that's all about all I have to say. So first of all, anyone who's uh, not here today and watching this recording, please feel free to shoot me an email with a question. Um, but there are some people here. So uh, do, do the students here have any questions for me? I can. Uh, don't um, I had a question regarding, I guess, like the programming side and CS side of this. Uh, what programming languages do you guys use for, for the machine learning? Uh, it's sort of, okay, so specifically for the machine learning, um, I, I do not recall what, they, what um, Aiden's lab uses. Um, typically, whatever, whatever uh, you're, the programming language you need to know is going to be related to the, the project that the mentor has, right? So mm -hmm. I, tend to, I tend to program in C++. Most of the people at CTPP use Python. Uh, so experience with those are, are good, are, are a plus. But you may, uh, you know, the, the, the mentor that you're assigned is going to sort of dictate the direction of the project, and that will include the programming language you use. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, we have a chat. We have one from the chat. Oh, okay. and she's indicating uh, when you mentioned time commitment, do you require, oh, I'm, I lost it there. Do you require this to be, uh, the only commitment during the summer, or are we allowed to take classes if we can manage to do so? Yeah, no. So um, the, essentially, you no, know, we want this to be a full-time job for you. And so classes um, and other, uh, you, so you're not allowed to take classes and you're not allowed to have another job outside of this one um, in order to participate in the program. Okay. Good question. Anyone else? Can um, professor apply? I'm just joking. Can professors apply? <laughs> I mean, if you if you are curious about science and willing to work hard, then yes. No, no. <laughs> and not to do anything else, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You don't, but you don't need a background. It sounds like a very very exciting program, and yeah, we've had great success with it, and yes. um, and a lot of students have gone on to uh, to graduate school. Um, and uh, it really, it's, it's been a great experience for a lot of students. Uh, many of the students that we've had say that this is the first time they ever thought about going to graduate yeah. school. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a really nice program. I think yeah. I hear someone talking. Is there another question? Uh -huh. Yes, I wanted to ask, after you mentioned that it'd be essentially like a full-time schedule about like how many hours a week are we putting within that 10 weeks? So this period? depends, yeah, this depends on the, um, this depends on the negotiation with your mentors. Okay. Um, and so, but typically we expect on the order of uh, 30 to 40 hours a week. Okay, that's not too bad. That is a full-time uh, schedule. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it being research, so a lot of the, as you, uh, if you know uh, graduate students or professors, often they work late, right? Yes, and we sir. don't want to do that to you. Right, so there are going to be very specific rules about what what the mentors are allowed to assign for you. Right, so you're going to have your weekends to yourself. You're going to have your evenings to yourself. Um, and so this is we do want this to be a job for you, but we don't want it to. You know, we're not trying to to break your spirit. We want you to succeed. Not cry. So. Yes, There's a question in the chat, Greg, yep. and someone is asking, can international students apply for this program? Um, as let's see, so the only. As long as you are able, so Rice University has constraints on um, um, on payments. I do not recall the specific uh, terminology, uh, but essentially, as long as Rice can legally pay you, you can apply and be accepted. If we, Rice is unable to pay you, Rice University is unable to pay you, then you cannot be a member. Okay, uh, thank so, you. If you have a specific question, because that, that may be related to some visa issues, and I, I, that's going to be always a very specific, personal specific thing, you can email me and I can check in. With, okay, well, that was a question from one of the students. Okay. And, okay. and it's a question with, that was posted in the chat. Yeah, okay, great. Other questions? Anyone else? So it's a short time frame. Uh, if you're interested, you need to. Uh, get your thoughts together on it and certainly get a, it doesn't say a, a letter of recommendation. So you, they don't need that. 
Nope, you don't need that. So okay. all we care about is the fact that you're excited and, and willing to, to work. That, that's, that's the key, so. Okay. Great. Well, I mean, thank you so much, Brett, for coming and talking to us about this really uh, interesting and, and fantastic opportunity. No, I'm I'm happy. To, I'm I'm very happy that you all had me, and uh, I do hope to. I do hope that some of your students found it interesting, and and I hope to hear from y'all. I hope to work with y'all. So, um, so yeah, just remember Friday the Friday the twelfth is the deadline. So just please uh, send in uh, send in applications if you're interested. Yeah. Y'all have one more question. Um, okay. So I'm, so I'm already going to graduate, so I don't think that, well, and, and I will be busy during the summer, so I can't apply for this, but I do plan on doing my own research after I graduate. Do you have any advice in terms of documenting um, your research progress and, and just staying organized um, in that from your experience? Documenting your research. So you're going to be doing a, a different program over the summer and you want to, to... Well, well, I'll be taking classes so I can't, um, okay. I can't apply to this, but, but after I graduate, like I'll be doing my, my own personal research. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I would, I would say that um, personal research is, is good um, and interesting. It helps a lot to have some sort of guidance. And so um, it, it's very difficult to, to be successful in research unless you do have a mentor of, of, of some sort. Um, I do not know the best way for you to acquire, uh, to, to, to find a mentor at UHD, um, but I do know that there are often um, research labs that are interested in, in working with undergrads. And so I, I would, I, the advice that I would give though is the best way to document this is to work with someone that can write you a letter um, not only because they can write you a letter, but because they can actually help you successfully uh, do new science, as opposed to, you know, essentially it's just, it's very hard to learn how to do this without guidance. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, anyone else? Well, let's, let's thank uh, Dr. Gassick and Dr. Morrison, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to give us this talk. Yep. Yes, for thank me. you. Yeah. Thank you for your patience. Oh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> but we ended up with a good amount, so that's good. That's yeah, a good crowd. All right. So, thank you, everybody, for coming. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you all for coming. Thank you. If you didn't sign in on the chat, go ahead and sign in before you leave, although I have most of the names in my head, but go ahead and sign in, and that way I will know you are here. Okay. Well, All right. Thanks so much. Yep. It was Thank nice you. talking to you. All, All right. right. Thank you. I think that's almost everybody. Thank you. Have a good one. Th Thank you. you. Time to go. I was just going to mention one more thing, Mary Jo. Thanks. Yeah, no, you wait and I'll, okay, uh, Giao, there we go, Dat, sign off. See, this is how you know they're, they're there or not there. Well, I mean, you can always. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I had to, I had to block because they were coming in at very late. Oh. Anyway. What were no, you what I was going to say, you can always get a report of the attendees uh, in Zoom. You know how to do that, right? Yes, yes. So then you can have the list. Well, I'm glad that a good number of students showed up. And well, it sounds like a good opportunity for someone who wants to dedicate the summer to do that. And yes, I wish they got more thing. spots. Yeah, I did too. But, uh, you know, my worry is, uh, well, well, we'll put the video up at the essay and the, they can go and we'll broadcast it but one more time. It's very tight. But, you know, you have to have a, I mean, this can be a special person of the 10, it's going to be a very special person because they're going to be with such high level. Yeah. It, it, it's a, it's some of them are going to be well, frightened. It is a very good opportunity to set them up toward success. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. what I mean. I got this email from, from Greg more than a year ago. Wow. He was willing to collaborate by help and write in a letter of support that if they get funded, I mean, to promote their programs and UHD. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you anyway, so much for including us. No, no, I mean, you're...